Okay, so the plan for today's lecture is as follows. Uh, my student, my, uh, Johnny, he's going to come at some point of time during the class and he's going to talk to you about how to solve assignment two. I know some of you had questions about the Simulink stuff. So he'll talk about it. If you have any questions about the specific, like how do you run the Simulink and all that stuff, you can ask him uh, at that time. Um, so until he comes in, so he had an interview with G, which is why he could not be here right now. So he'll come sometime during the class and then we'll, we'll uh, turn our attention to the MATLAB Simulink thing. Uh, so, so right now, the goal is to continue our discussion with, uh, about dynamic watermarking algorithm. Uh, and, and then when he comes in, we'll, we'll switch gear and we'll talk about the assignment uh, too. So I have a system xt plus 1 equals to f of xt ut wt. Uh, my ut has to lie in u of xt. So this is the action set, the admissible action set depends on the state xt. So typically, uh, if you are driving a vehicle, then the, so in the vehicle example, uh, if you're driving a vehicle, then the constraint will look something like this. My UT, which is the accelerator or brake position, should be less than equal to some function, F2 of the velocity, which will be XT. This is the velocity and it would be greater than or equal to f1 of xt. So this, oh, f, f is used twice here. Let me use h1 and h2. <clears throat> okay, so my accelerator or brake position has to be within certain bounds, and those bounds depend on the actual velocity of the vehicle at that time. It could also be steering, where uh, ut is the steering angle of the wheel, and that depends on the upper and lower bound, which depends on the velocity of the vehicle. And some of these constraints are physical constraints, which means that you just cannot violate the constraint. So if you have a battery, uh, there's only so much current you can draw from the battery, okay, without uh, causing physical damage to the battery. So in some cases, it's because of the physics or chemistry of the problem that there are these constraints on the action. Uh, in some cases, the constraints are more because of the user experience. So in the case of steering angle, well, arguably, even at 100 miles an hour, you can steer your vehicle in any way you want. It's not a physical constraint, but certainly the experience is going to be pretty bad. So depending on the situation, sometimes these constraints are hard constraints because of the physics or chemistry or biology of the problem, uh, or sometimes it's because of the user experience. So you don't want the user of the product to experience a bad situation. So that's why you put some constraints that could depend on the state of the system. I mean, you can, you can cook up such examples again and again. So you don't want the temperature of this room. You don't want to pump air into the room if the temperature is within certain bounds. So this could be 70 degrees Fahrenheit and this could be 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Or it could be dependent on the outside weather. Uh, so, so yeah, because of various uh, uh, reasons, you have constraints on the action and those constraints depend on the current state of the system. So that's why I write ut is in u of xt, and for this kind of constraint, I could write u of xt as ut such that h1 of xt is less than equals to ut is less than equal to 
H2 of xt. <coughs> Okay, so that's the model for our decision process. Now, what would be an admissible policy? So, what kind of control policies can you design in this situation? Well, remember that the control policy takes as input the current state and then identifies what value of ut we need to take. So, I'll look at the current velocity and based on certain considerations, I'm going to figure out how much acceleration or brake I must uh, apply on the vehicle in order to uh, remain safe and get to my destination. So in these cases, the way you define a policy, so you want your policy gamma that maps x to u such that gamma of xt lies in u of xt. So this is one way to define admissible policies. These are known as admissible policies because it satisfies all the constraints on the system. Okay, so these policies are what is known as deterministic policy and the reason why it is called deterministic is because for a single state, the policy gives you the specific action that needs to be taken. So if I'm driving at 70 miles an hour, the policy is going to tell me exactly what action I need to pick, which is probably uh, coast. Do not accelerate, do not break this coast or provide a constant acceleration to the vehicle, which is equal to the drag on the vehicle. So that way you are driving at a constant speed. But if you are at 45 miles an hour, then the policy will tell you, okay, you have to press the accelerator to this particular level so as to increase your speed all the way to 70 miles an hour as soon as possible. So that's known as the uh, admissible policies and these are called deterministic policies because you get a deterministic action for every state. Now I want to introduce a new class of policies known as randomized policies. Which basically maps x to the probability measures over u. So now gamma of xt is a probability measure over u of xt. So here probability measure over a set a is defined as P12, let me define the set A as 1 to N or 1 to M. So P1 to PM such that summation of PI equals to 1, PI is greater than or equal to 0. This is the set of probability measures over the set capital A. Okay. Is
is the notion of randomized policies clear any questions so far how would you what do you think how would you implement a randomized policy so the way you are defining the policy is you give get a state and then you have a distribution over all the actions you can possibly take at that instant how do you think you would implement such an action so my question is i have defined what is known as randomized policies where you get a state and the policy will tell you a probability distribution over action okay then how will you take the action what's the approach for you to take the action So let's think about it. You are hungry, so that's your state. So you wake up in the morning, you are hungry, that's the state of your system, biological system, right? And you open your refrigerator and there are like seven items in the refrigerator. There may be bread, there may be cheese, there may be like sandwich or whatever, right? So six or seven items. How are you going to make a decision? You, you like all of them. Whatever is there in your refrigerator, you like all of them. you're not averse to any of the food that's in the refrigerator how are you going to pick the item that you want to eat in the morning i say like if i yesterday ate something i eat something else <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> that's a good strategy so if i ate something yesterday i'm going to eat something else today uh, but that something else is let's say there you ate something yesterday so then there are six items that is something you did not eat yesterday how are you going to pick you can only eat one item so what are you going to pick how are you going to pick well the simplest solution is to toss a coin and figure out what of the which item you want to eat at that moment right so this there is a tossing of coin involved and that's exactly what i mean by a distribution over the actions that you are that's there so in your case your state is your state has two dimensions one is that you are hungry and one is what you ate yesterday okay so you have two states in your system now based on the two states that you are hungry and you have eaten let's say a sandwich yesterday the admissible actions is do not eat sandwich so everything other than sandwich is part of your admissible action set and then you have a probability measure assuming it's a uniform probability measure so then you're going to toss a coin and figure out okay i have to eat item number 3 today because that's what the outcome of the coin toss is so that's how you implement randomized policy you you have a state your policy gives you a probability measure over all the actions all the feasible actions at that time and then you toss a coin uh and then based on the outcome of the toss you pick one of the actions and then you you implement that action now i want you to contrast this uh this approach with the dynamic watermarking approach we talked about in the previous class let me remind you so my ut in the previous class was k x hat t plus et this was noise gaussian noise right so this is your actual strategy this is the strategy that you would like to take and then you added a gaussian noise and how do you generate this gaussian noise well you use a random number generator to generate this gaussian noise so this is actually a randomized policy So here gamma of x hat t is k x hat t and sigma e 
Okay, so in the previous class, we had already introduced randomized policy. We just didn't call it randomized policy at that time. Okay, so the way to implement a randomized policy is that you get a distribution and you use a random number generator to identify a point that is distributed according to that distribution and then you implement that action in your control system, whatever that control system may be. Okay, now Arguably, this approach is far more general in comparison to this approach, okay? And the reason for that is here, I'm not putting any restriction on, this, on the action. ET could be very large, ET could be very small, but UT has to implement this particular algorithm, uh, this particular uh, realization. Whereas in this case, I'm explicitly constraining the set of actions on the system that can be taken, and then I'm distributing, I'm picking a distribution based on uh, the set of actions that are, uh, that are available to me at that time, at that particular state. So this is more general than what was taught in the previous class. But the generality comes at a cost. What is the cost we are going to pay? The analysis is going to be pretty difficult, number one, and number two, the state and action pairs are assumed to be finite. So you don't have unlimited number of state action pairs. There are only finite number of state action pairs. In the queuing example that you saw, you had finite number of state action pairs. So that was a situation where this kind of assumption is satisfied. Uh, but in, uh, there are other systems where you could implement algorithms of this type uh, without much problem. There may be some implementation details that you need to figure out, but you can implement this kind of algorithms in those systems, particularly when the noise uh, magnitude is small. <clears throat> okay, so we are going to assume finite state, finite action. We are going to assume state dependent action set. We are going to assume randomized policies so that you can pick a probability distribution over actions. And the previous class, whatever we studied, is an example of a randomized policy that was implemented on the system. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. All right. Now I want you to, I, I want to point out a simple fact uh, here, so suppose gamma 1 and gamma 2 are randomized policies. Let beta be between 0 and 1 is beta gamma 1 plus 1 minus beta gamma 2, is that also a randomized policy? Yes. Right? Why is it a randomized policy? Because for every state xt, gamma 2 of xt is a distribution, probability distribution. Gamma 1 of xt is a probability distribution. I take a convex combination of two probability distribution, I get a probability distribution, right, over the same support set. So therefore, this is also randomized policy. <clears throat> so,
So if I mix two policies, that's a randomized policy. Perfect. Okay. So we have learned a few things. Uh, we have an MDP, we have state dependent action set, we have defined the notion of randomized policy within that uh, MDP in Markov decision problem. And we have learned this, co this cool fact that if I pick two randomized policy and I take a convex combination of that randomized policy, I get another randomized policy. That's a, that's a cool thing. Now here is what happens in the system. So I have a, I have the system. Uh, <coughs> I have the controller. I have the system, which is actually a physical system. I have an attacker, which then feeds information to the controller. So y of t, x of t, u of t. Now this attacker may or may not be there. So Okay, so I want you to think about what happens when there is no attacker versus what happens when there is an attacker in this block diagram. So this is a closed loop system. Yeah. What happens when there is an attacker in the system? Yt will be different from xt. If there is no attacker in the system, then xt will be equal to yt. So no attack, xt is equal to yt under an attack, xt is not equal to yt. Okay, so that's the first observation we have based on this block diagram. Just like in the previous case, controller observes observes uh, y1, u1, yt, ut. So controller observes y and then takes an action and then the controller observes uh, y and then takes another action and so on and so forth. So that's the second fact we observe by looking at this block diagram. Okay. So how should we set up our hypothesis? So let's say the problem is whether we have to figure out whether there is an attacker in the system or not. How should we set up our hypothesis test? What would, what would our H naught be? And what would our HA be? Remember that in the previous case, in the LTI system, we had defined what is known as residual of the system, uh, RT, and then our H naught was RT is Gaussian, 
or RBRT is Gaussian, and HA was RBRT is not Gaussian, right? That was our two hy like the null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. So we, we, we haven't defined residual here. We can't define residual because residual was defined for an LTI system. We have a more general system here. In fact, we have a discrete state and discrete action system. So we can't really define this notion of residual that was defined for the LTI system. So how should we define H naught and HA? So let's think about it. What happens when there is no attack? Xt is equal to yt, right? So the controller is observing x1, y1, x2, y2, and, and so on in the case of no attack. So H0, let's uh, pick some randomized policy. I mean, we'll pick some policy gamma. So the H0 would be y1, u1, yt, ut. Uh, they are coming from yt plus 1 equals to f of yt gamma yt wt. Gamma is some randomized policy, okay? So I have a randomized policy gamma and I'm trying to check whether my observations are coming from this particular evolution equation or not. HA is, does not come from Does that make sense? So does, does y uh, t plus one comes from that function? Right. Even if there is an attack, like no. When there is no attack, then this would be true. When there is an attack it will not come from this distribution, I mean this evolution oh. equation, right? So that's why that's HA, alternate hypothesis. Okay, so this is the recipe, this is uh, the actual recipe for coming up with attack detection strategy using uh, hypothesis test, right? I'm just following the recipe. What happens when there is no attack? What happens when there is an attack? Uh, and then I define my H naught based on the information that the controller has. The controller can observe that information. I can't have my H naught, the no attack case, based on information that controller doesn't have. So in this case, controller doesn't know what X1, X2, X3, and so on is, because there may be an attacker sitting in the system. So I have used the information, that is at the controller's uh, memory, to come up with the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is considering the situation when there is no attack on the system. So everything is well known. I know the F because I have used that system for, uh, for hundreds of years. I know the distribution of noise. I know the policy that I'm using. So I'm going to set up my null hypothesis in this way because everything here is known to the controller. The controller can test for H0. And if this condition is not met, then there is an attack on the system because that's what our model, that's what we are trying to detect. Okay, so I'm going to end the class here, uh, the, the theory portion of the class, and I'm going to talk about how you detect, how to set up the hypothesis, I mean, what is the uh, test statistics 
and the threshold will come up with a Q sum type test statistic for solving this hypothesis test and then figuring out when there is an attack on the system and when there is no attack on the system. Uh, I have already showed you where that test statistics comes from, so you should look into your notes for Markov chains with unknown post change distribution. So this is unknown distribution after the change happens. So if you look up that particular lecture, maybe like six or seven lectures ago, I talked about it. So that's what the hypothesis, that's how we will test whether the H0 is true or HA is true. And we'll come up with the mean time between false alarm and mean delay. So that's what I'll do in the next class. Now I'm going to hand over the rest of the lecture to Johnny, who's going to show you how assignment two needs to be done. So basically, uh, in the base study, you first need to kind of uh, run, I think there is a section named P0. So you should run the P0 first. This will kind of set up all the parameters for the plant disturbance and the heat exchanger plant. And then in, in the P, uh, I think in the problem one, <coughs> you will design a noisy version of this uh, chemical uh, reactor plant. So without adding the noise, this is a ideal system without any system noise. And you should, after you run the P0 and the P1 section, you should, you should get the, a, a correct uh, controller's response. And then the idea for this too is that you first add a white noise to the observation uh, from the uh, heat exchanger plant back into the controller. So here we will have a PI controller here and the, and the plant. And after the plant, you will output the observations. So in the observation feedback, YN, you will yeah, in the observation feedback YN, you will add the noise here. And after the noise, uh, here we have some uh, spec uh, specifications for what kind of noise you need to add. And then after you add the noise, you should rerun the system with a noisy version of the observations. And then you should first check that by only adding the, the noise to the system, the system is still stable. So that's the scoop of the first uh, of the first problem uh, yeah when adding noise there is one there are two power in the pv rotation like set the parameter power to noise power uh i think uh you can uh either either set a variable named the power in the p0 or you can directly uh type your variance in the noise generator block. So here in the simulink, there is a, uh, white, no a white noise uh, generator. Block. And then in, in that block, uh, there is a variance, there is a uh, specification for the variance of the noise. You can either type the variable name you defined in P0, or you can manually type the numbers. So it's up to you. You can, you can double check if these two variables are already defined in the, in the P0 section. And if it is defined, then in the noise block, you just recall that variable name. That will be. But you have to run P0 first. Yes, yes, yes. Because it defines all the parameters for this. Scene. Is there any? So here I think this is a, uh, a noisy version of the system. Once you define the, the noise block and the correct power of the noise, you should get something like this. So there is a disturbance here, and then uh, the controller gradua gradually uh, stabilizes the system. Yes. So here, um, this is another noise. So remember, in the beginning, we kind of add the noise to the observations uh, here uh, uh, to the YN. But uh, in the second, the second uh, part of the problem, because we are considering applying uh, dynamic watermarking to the control signal, so there is another watermark need to be added to here. So here, this is the, so this is the control signal. This is the feedback signal. So 
we, we, we in the P1, we already add a noise here as the system noise. And then the next step will be add a noise here as the dynamic watermark. Uh, I mean, so, yeah, I think the noise should be out of here. this will make no yeah. impact to the control. simulate a attacker. Yeah. So so far I haven't talked about the attacker yet. So and the the, the first uh, part of the question two will be adding the watermark into the signal with the attack. Uh, and then the next part will be the uh, let me see. So then one is the I think is the step to add the watermark and uh, step two is the one to add the attacker. So to give you a what's going on for the attacker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, basically, it's like uh, all the distributions of the system is the same. So remember, uh, in previously, we have the system update equations. So the equations should be the same, but which means the distribution of your next state, state is the same. But uh, the realization is different. So f for example, we can, we can have a uh, Gaussian distributed random variable, but uh, we can generate it according to this distribution types, but different visualizations. So what the attacker can do is to use the same uh, distribution to generate a another XT plus one so that, uh, of, uh, of designing this type of. to uh, kind of uh, switch from the attacked case and the non-attacked case by using a indicator variable is attacked. So once you have implemented the uh, attack in uh, A2, then in B, you will have a switch in Simulink to decide whether the attacker will 
whether like xt equals to yt or xt not equals to yt, basically. And then, this yeah. has to be added there somewhere here. So, so here, um, we should have a, a, uh, a identical uh, system as these two blocks. And then, here, and then all the, all the control actions will be feed to this, to this system as well. And uh, we have like two different types of two, two different uh, no noise block. Uh, one is added to this uh, actual system. One is added to the uh, the attacker system. They have the same distribution to kind of uh, mimic the same uh, system dynamics. Uh, but the realization, because we, we have two noise block, so the realizations of the observations are different. And that observation will feed here? Yes. So we'll break this so, link mm -hmm. and we'll feed that observation. Yes. So the controller will never know the actual feedback in the attack case. The controller will not, not know this feedback. The, uh, the controller will only know the feedback that is generated by the attacker. So there is an identical uh, Planck model here, which you can copy from those two. And you add a system noise here to the actual plant, and you use the same block to add a noise here in the attacker's uh, 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 like a virtual system. And then uh, the, 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 the observation in the generated in the attacker's system will then feed back to the controller. So if you do the switch, you have like, so one is the attacker's feedback, one is the actual system feedback. You can have a switch here to switch from the, uh, the, the non-attacked case and the attacked case. Yeah. Or will yeah. this signal to go through? Yeah. Uh, my, my question is, uh, it doesn't make a difference if it's not at that point, at the XN point. Uh, it makes a difference. It, it makes because a difference. This is a set point. Yes. Set point. And, and the attacker cannot uh, reach that point. Right. He can, he can it can only change the temperature the feedback. Feedback. So it can only change the readings here in the okay. not at Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are two detectors, right? Yes. So then after you define the and the watermarked control system, uh, the next part of the problem will be design a, one is the, the chi-square distribution, uh, the chi-square detector, and another is the q sum detector. And I think all the, Formulation. Uh, the, for, the, the formulas are for those two detectors are uh, provided. So, in, in, in this part, the first thing you want to do is to actually uh, find the set of residuals uh, from the based on controllers of the observations. So, as Professor Gupta already explained, uh, in the LTI system, you can. Uh, based on the sequence of the observation you collected, you can calculate what your uh, residuals are over the time. And then those uh, chi-square detector and the QSUM de detector are nothing but a function. The test statistics AC is nothing but a function of the set of residuals you collected. So in Simulink, you should, you should first calculate the set of residuals and then apply this formula to kind of calculate your test statistics. And then in both cases, you will have, you, you can define a threshold tau uh, to uh, kind of uh, indicate whether there is a attack in the system or not. So basically, this is a design parameter you can tune to kind of adjust your false positive and false negative rates. And then it's the, uh, it's the dynamic watermarking uh, case. So I think in the previous, uh, mm, 
I think in the previous problem, uh, you don't have the, you won't have the uh, you you won't have the the noise to the controller signal yet. So for the chi square and the uh, Q sum uh, detector, since those are like passive detection algorithms, you don't apply like active defense, which means you don't change the control signals with the second noise I just said. So for the chi square and Q sum, you only add noise to the observation part. But for the dynamic watermarking, you add the noise to the control signal as well. So, mm -hmm. so for chi square and Q sum, you only add noise to the T Y N. Yeah, you don't actually watermark. But for the for the uh, dynamic watermarking, you add the, so here. In both cases, you are adding noise here. Yes. But for the passive detection, such as chi square and Q sum, you don't add noise here. But in dynamic watermarking case, you will add noise here. So if you do active de defense, you will actively change the behavior of the controller. But if you only do like passive attack, you, you won't change any control behavior. So that's the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then basically, the difference is that before and after adding the noise to the control signals, you will have a different set of residuals calculated from your observations. And uh, you can, in, in the, I think in the assignment, you can see that uh, for this type of attack, where the attacker trying to mimic an identical system, if you don't add the noise to the control signal, then the residuals will not indicate there is an attack. But after you add the residuals to your control signal, then the set of residuals will indicate there is an attack. So there is a difference. So this means that uh, the dynamic watermarking algorithm should be effective against this type of attack, but uh, the chi-square and the Q-sum test will fail to detect the attack because you don't have the active defense applied on the control signal. So that's the uh, basic. So even after watermarking, yeah, we kind of compare the, so in, in, in the assignment, I think you will be asked to plot the, the, the value of the test statistics over the time for each of the detection algorithm. And then uh, mm, you can see that uh, if you only do like chi-square or q-sum, even if there is an attacker, the test statistics won't blow up. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, for most of the time, it will not exceed the threshold you set. But in the dynamic watermarking case, uh, you will observe that over the time, the test statistics you calculated will kind of roughly increases linearly, and then it will eventually across the threshold you set. Yeah, I think uh, here they have a plot of the, of the, uh, yeah, so you should first have a set of residuals over the time you calculate it based on your observations. And then, you, and then based on the residuals, you use the formula to calculate your QSUM test statistics. So this is the value of the test statistics. The x-axis is the time. Y-axis is the value of the test statistics. And then you can see that uh, in, the, uh, in, some, in, some of the, in some of the tests, the test statistics is rather stable, but uh, in some of the tests, the test statistics will go like, like this. So those are the differences. And a stable like test statistics means you don't detect such attack. And for a blow, blowed up test statistics, it means that you find the attack.
Thank you everyone uh, on Friday we will continue our discussion on dynamic